Leadership is like everything else in life. We tend to repeat what we know. We tend to do over and over again what we've seen because it makes sense. In fact, it's the paradigm that we think is right. Uh, I built custom furniture as a hobby and then force it on my children. But in making furniture, there are many times you make duplicates of something. Uh, for example, in a baby crib, you might well make a lot of spindles. Well, anybody with any common sense and logic knows that what you ought to do is you ought to make the original and then you make the second one off that original and the fifth one off that original and, and each generation of whatever you make should be made off the original. Truth is, I've seen it happen in a lot of guys' workshops. What happens in the confusion is somewhere along the line, the original doesn't get marked as clearly, and you begin to make successive generations off a duplication that's not the original. So what can happen is the eighth generation becomes what you make the 12th and 13th and 14th and 15th. And then you use the 15th or 16th generation to make the 20th or whatever it is. And every time, it moved a little and you didn't realize it. And so what happens is what you're copying now is not what you meant to copy. That same concept, I think, applies to this, this issue of leadership. Those of us who love the church and who want to lead in it, we have a tendency to copy what we know, what we've seen. Oh, we're going to tweak it and try to make it better, but, but we're still working off a pattern that seemed right when it may not be what it ought to be. My basic premise would be that in the New Testament and the call of Christ and the church as it's established that we're to, in, to emulate, shepherding is the central issue in leadership. But in the Western church, it tends to be coordinators, activity directors, people who love Jesus and preach and teach, so don't, don't hear any insult on that. But it's still not the core issue of raising up shepherds. There's a couple of things that, that have sort of taught that, that to us in the last set of years. Uh, let me use a couple of, 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 of different countries. Traumatic events tend to sometimes cause you to break the pattern you've been doing and have to do something different. And we're shocked at what we find when you break the pattern. Let me use Vietnam. In the mid-70s, Vietnam had a massive transition in its government. And when the new government came in, it was, not, it was not supportive of the churches. In fact, the church itself went under a tremendous amount of persecution. One particular denomination, one family of, of Christians who, who love Christ, in the 1970s, when its leadership was officially driven out, all Westerners were driven out, its, its official leadership in the churches, those people were arrested and sent to re-education camps, in the mid-70s, they knew there were around 75,000 believers. They'd taken years and years and years to help develop about 75,000 believers. It went through a silent period. About 20, 25 years went by, and they did not know what was happening in Vietnam. When they got to go back to Vietnam in the mid to late 90s, they wondered, what has happened to the 75,000? They showed up, and that particular family group was one million. The shock was how could it be one million because all of the leadership as we know it, 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 it was decimated. And the answer, pretty simple. You talk to the believers of that particular church family and say, what happened? They said, all we knew to do was we couldn't do church like we'd always done it. All we knew to do was look after each other. And so shepherds arose in that group. And an incredible transformation began to occur in the advance of the gospel. China has a similar story. Uh, you can debate the numbers. There's a little variation in them, but let's say 700 to 800,000 believers in China when China had the same thing after World War II. Right now, anybody from the outside not knowing the final answer would say, wow, the oppression that occurs on the communist government upon the church must be awful. The answer is no. They're baptizing and bringing into the church family that 700 to 800,000 every month in China now. 
I've sat with Chinese leaders. I, I've sat with people and said, how did you do it? What is happening? How are people finding Christ? And how are people being discipled into Christ? And the answer always turns out to be, we began to shepherd differently. The Western church has not had the persecution, but the Western church in its pattern, duplication, has moved too far from shepherding and has become a leadership that runs activities and highly personable and talks about Jesus and wants to bring people to Jesus. And it raises up a lot of decision makers, but our shortage of shepherds has grabbed us. So how do you shepherd? How do you actually practically do this? Well, I want to use a, a visual metaphor, an, an illustration. Uh, I hope you'll feel generous and cut me some slack. And let me start with this simple question. How would you love a town? How would you love a town? I'm going to draw something here that any art teacher would absolutely uh, hate. I want to draw what has some equivalency of looking like city streets. You say that looks nothing like city streets. Eh, use your imagination. If you were to go love that town, how would you do it? Where would you start? I don't know how you'd begin to. It's, it's big. It's complex. I, I don't know how to love this city. Well, about the only way you would ever find out to do it is you'd have to go find an intersection. And you park yourself at an intersection. And all you do, and, and I don't mean this literally, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking a bit metaphorically, but you would find an intersection and you spend time at that intersection. Here's what you're going to find. The town suddenly becomes less complex because you begin to notice the same mom begins to drive uh, her kids to school every morning. And that same old man takes his dog for a walk. And, and there's the old woman who goes down to the store. And, and you begin to notice the young guy in the sports car. And, and as you park at that intersection or live at that intersection, you begin to find, oh, there's individuals here that I can begin to connect with and begin to work with and begin to figure out. You wouldn't be able to love that town in a general way till you find an intersection to begin to work out of. Well, if I can switch that picture in your mind, can I make this the church, the local congregation? This sort of might even be the, the congregational life, the map, so to speak, of, of, of a good active congregation. Let me take it to be the congregation that I was a part of for, for 30 some years. When people came to our church, and, and I don't mean this, I don't mean this arrogantly, but they did like it. It was fun. They would come in and they would find so many things they wanted to join in on. They would find a Bible school class they loved. And, and, and when they would come, they would get in that Bible school class, and they'd find an intersection over here. They loved volunteering with that activity that the uh, high school youth group does. And they would find something down here in missions they really liked. And, and there would be another intersection over here that they found, and they would just begin to get themselves involved in so many things in the life of the congregation. And I'm glad. Had no problem with that. I, I'm glad you're enjoying the congregational life. But I can tell you, that I knew when people began to get it. Now, we had to help teach to it. We had to talk to it. We had to work through it. But you could tell when someone began to get it. Well, how could you tell when someone began to get it? Well, what they would begin to do is take themselves out of intersections. And they would begin to withdraw from intersections. And somebody's going to go, wow, that doesn't look like much progress. Oh, no. No, this is good. When they began to come out of these intersections, we knew something was beginning to happen at a deeper level. Why? Why are they coming out of all these multiple intersections? Let me use a simple um, illustration, a simple uh, pattern you'd see. You might take this family and you would call them up and, and you would say, hey, we need some help on Tuesday night. We're doing X, Y, Z or whatever it is. And, and you guys are free. Would, would you be willing? And do you have any interest in, 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 in coming and being a part of that? And they would say to you, no, we're, we're honored you would ask. So thankful you would ask. But no, we're really not available on Tuesday night. You say, well, what about Wednesday night for this? We could still leave people. We, we need people to really help with. And they say, well, you know, I, thanks for asking, but no, our Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights are pretty committed. 
You see, that's the night we call them the parents of our four-year-olds. And you, and, what, I'm sorry. Yeah, we teach four-year-olds on Sunday morning. And we use Tuesday nights. That's the night that, that we're in the homes of the, the parents. That's where we, 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 we check on. That's where we try to pursue. That's, that's when we have them in our house. And you begin to hear a story. And the story goes something like this. Uh, a, a single mom would say, it was the parents of my four-year-old. It was, it was the teachers of my four-year-old. And, and they teach on Sunday mornings, but they were the ones who called us up. And, and they said to us, you know, we pray for Sean, honored to teach him on, on Sunday mornings. But, but we realized while we have prayed for Sean, we've never had a chance to pray with you about the raising of Sean. We know you're a single mom, and, and it can't be easy. And we wanted to just know, we won't take much time. We just sit on the porch or, or, or be happy to meet you at McDonald's. But, but we would love to meet with you, and we'd love to hear more of your story. And, and do you mind... Do you mind if we just sit and pray with you about the raising of Sean? And, and, and she said, it was out of those Tuesday nights of meeting with them once or twice over a year, and, and, and we began to tell the story, and the next thing I knew, this family began to be deep in our lives. And when I had to go to the hospital, they were the ones that looked after Sean. And, and when the car broke down, they were the ones who were in our life. That single moms began to tell a story of, I love my church because the leaders in my church pray with me and my leaders in my church come and check with me and the leaders in my church have had me in their homes for supper. I don't know what I would do without that family helping me to look after Sean. In fact, to broaden this out, if, if you teach four-year-olds in any church, typically there's a good chance you have 30 families that use that four-year-old intersection. Probably 30 families. Now, they won't all be there the same Sunday, but those 30 families. And if you said, this is an intersection where Christ calls me to be more than an activity runner, more than a decision maker, more than somebody who somehow gathers the class and is personable, but he's called me to be as Christ was to people. This is an intersection I could begin to shepherd out of. And so, if you have 30 families using that intersection, if you're taught four-year-olds, you'll have four or five or six single parents. And those single parents ought to be able to tell a story. If there were somebody who took a, an interest in being kind to us, and they began to pray with us, it wasn't complex, wasn't, wasn't anything hard, but they would call us up every now and then and say, can, can we meet you at McDonald's? Love to buy you a Coke. Just want to pray with you. If you teach four-year-olds at a, at, at a church, out of that 30 families, you, you, you're going to have two or three or four that are grandparents raising kids. And so a phone call that they get going, hey, we're so glad to have Stephanie in class, and we love teaching Stephanie. But we also know there's a bit of a story going on, and we don't want to intrude, but we would be so delighted to hear the story. And, and we've been praying, but, but could we come and, and could we just come and sit on the porch and visit with you, and could we pray with you? And grandparents begin to tell a story about their daughter, Barbara, who went back to treatment center. And so the court gave us the kids, and we're kind of over our head again, but we're raising these kids best we can. And every set of grandparents in a church ought to be able to tell a story about a set of leaders who loved us and walked with us through that journey. And we didn't just raise a four-year-old on our own. There were people who loved us and took the journey with us. If you teach four-year-olds at a church, there'll be six or seven of those marriages that probably are a little tense. It's pretty simple. Somebody who, who's checking four-year-old children in, and they begin to tell a story later, I love my church. Because when our marriage was a little dicey and we didn't know where it was going to go, there were just some people who loved on us. And they had us over for supper just once or twice or had dessert with us, or they would just call us every now and then and pray with us. And next thing we knew after praying, we began to talk a little bit, and they began to help us, and they walked with us, and they connected us. And what you have is not complex, but it is a biblical truth. The body of Christ is designed to heal itself.
And the body of Christ is designed to minister to itself. And instead of having some complex activity where we funnel all the singles or all the grandparents, and I'm not opposed to those activities, but I am in favor of restoring what appears to be biblical Christianity, which is it's more like an anthill, and we're raising up leaders. We're raising up people who say, I will be at an intersection. If you teach four-year-olds out of that 30, There'll be five or six families that are great families, but just friendships are hard for them to get. They're living on the run and they don't have friendships. They're able to tell a story that somebody took an interest in our life. That concept of shepherding out of an intersection, I believe, becomes the core of how real shepherding occurs for most leaders. But that's not how we're able to do it because many leaders find they're paralyzed. Many leaders find this is the intersection that you're at. You, you, you do this during the 9 o'clock hour, and you do this during the 11 o'clock hour with a different group, and you do this over here on Tuesday nights, and, and you're here on Thursday nights, and, and you're here on Friday nights, and your life is so ingrained in the life of the church because you love the church, but here's what you are. You're somebody who would love to take better care of people, but everybody gets a bit of a lick and a promise. Everybody gets a certain sense of, I care, but I don't know how to follow up on it. To use our analogy we used earlier, we funnel people to a set of activities, and we run the activity, and they scatter. And Ezekiel 34 is crying out, where are my shepherds? Where are my shepherds. The church works best when a man or woman decides, I think I could get it. I don't have to know everything. I'm not the smartest or the best, but I love the people of God, and I'm willing to be personal and pursue them. You say, what would give me the right to get anybody's life. What would give me the right? I, I, I'm nobody. What would give me the right to, to go to somebody's life and to step into it and, and say, hey, could I sit at your porch and just pray with you? Or, or hey, I just love to hear your story. Or what would give me the right to go sit in a waiting room with a family? I, I just teach the, the, the four-year-old. What right would I have to go get in their life? Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to use a, the illustration of a... Uh, Smoke detector. Smoke detectors get attention, and, and nobody thinks anything's wrong with a smoke detector gets any attention because typically the smoke detectors ask for it. It chirps. You, 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 you begin to get up and mess with the battery. You give it any attention. You, you clean it. You give it any, any of your thought. It's bec normally because that smoke detector gave a chirp. You don't need a license. You don't need an, a role and an authority. You don't need a title. All you have to do is plant your life at an intersection. And if you will plant your life at an intersection where you simplify your life, if you will simplify at any level, if you'll make it more simple and you'll focus, if you'll simplify and focus, People will chirp. You're checking a four-year-old and you put them over the counter and you say, how was your week? And a mom will say, it wasn't easy. I got mom in the hospital. And we've been running back and forth. You don't have to do anything at the moment, but you go home and you pray for that family and you think about it. You just heard a chirp. It's the easiest thing in the world to pick up a phone and call that mother of that four-year-old and say, you said it was hard this week. Could we bring Stu by on, on, on Monday or Tuesday night? It's not fancy. We're not great, but what would Stu help? And the next thing you know, compassion is taking you into somebody's life. There'll be chirps. You, you're taking a four-year-old off of a counter, over a counter into your class, and you say, how was your week? You'll get a chirp. The chirp is going, ah, it was John, John's job. It was a little iffy on, on, on the second shift. Are they going to keep it or not? You don't have to do a single thing there, but you can call a family up that night or three nights later, or you write a note that goes, when you said on Sunday, here's what we can count on. We are praying for you. 
Not only are we praying for you, but if there's time before or after class next week, or could we come to your porch? We'd love to just sit on your porch. Could we just pray with you about the job? Next thing you know, there's every right, and people are so grateful that somebody cared enough to step into their life. We're going to pick up the next session. Well, what would I do? What would I do if I began to take my life and I began to simplify and I began to focus and I put myself at an intersection while I took myself maybe out of others, not because they're not important, but they're just not. I may go to those things, but this is my focus. What would I do if I began to shepherd out of those? It's a pretty clear biblical answer. We'll pick it up in the next session.